So this is going to be a little bit different than usual. It's going to be a bit shorter because we're just going to be going over one concept, really, which is the free expansion of an ideal gas. And that's in contrast to what I've talked about previously in my video about entropy in general and my video about engines and air conditioners and thermodynamic cyclic processes. Because in those, we talked a lot about our explored the concept of adiabatic expansion and compression and isothermal expansion and compression, which are when you have constant temperature, isothermal, and constant entropy, adiabatic. And so the free expansion of an ideal gas is neither. It resembles the isothermal case, but it is different in several very important ways. And the free expansion of an ideal gas is sort of the canonical example of an irreversible, spontaneous entropy increase. Because when I talked about entropy previously, I didn't really talk very much about spontaneous increase, which is ironic because that's usually what people talk about when they talk about entropy. But that's because spontaneous entropy increases are in some sense the non-equilibrium part of thermodynamic processes. And again, I am constantly explaining how equilibrium is a very sort of dicey concept, and we're always kind of hand-waving and saying things are in equilibrium, but they never really are. But the free expansion of an ideal gas is, is very definitely not an equilibrium process, right? It's a process where you manifestly break equilibrium, and then you reach a new equilibrium, and that new equilibrium has higher entropy in a way that cannot be undone, right? So let me just go to animations now. And you see the adiabatic and isothermal cases that I showed in the previous videos, where you have the piston moving up and down. And in the adiabatic case, you have no heat transfer in or out. So perfect thermal insulation, and that results in all of the work done during the expansion or compression. So during compression, work is done on the gas. During expansion, work is done by the gas on the environment or on the piston. And that results in the gas heating up or cooling down, he heats up during compression and cools down during expansion because the work gets converted into the internal energy of the gas because that's the only place it can go because it's insulated from the environment. In the isothermal case, we have the opposite, where there's perfect thermal conduction, and 100% of the work comes from heat transfer from the environment. And both of these are idealizations, but isothermal is actually the sort of more impossible of the two, because you can get pretty good thermal insulation, but you can never really have heat transfer across zero temperature gradient, right? So for the isothermal expansion and compression to work, you have to have heat transfer to and from the environment, right? So whatever is surrounding that cylinder has to have heat flow into and out of it. Well, heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a place with one temperature to another place with the exact same temperature. And so in order to get heat flow, you have to have some temperature gradient. And so you never really have isothermal expansion and compression. You never really have adiabatic either because you can't perfectly insulate anything. But isothermal is sort of not really possible even in principle, but it's still very useful to think about. And it's going to turn out that the free expansion more closely resembles this isothermal case. And this is where I want to remind you something I did explain it, I think, reasonable length in the original entropy video I made, which is that entropy is a state variable, which means it does not matter how the gas gets to the state it's in. All that matters is the current state. And for an ideal gas, you only ever need two parameters to determine the state, because PV equals NRT is one equation with three variables in it. So if you know two of the three variables and you have an equation relating them, you can solve for the third. And so if we know, say, the pressure and the temperature, we can determine the volume, or more accurately, the volume per mole, because we're dealing with 
primarily intensive quantities here. Pressure and temperature are inherently intensive quantities. They're independent of the size of the system. Uh, volume is an extensive quantity. It depends linearly on the size of the system, but we generally talk about the volume per unit mass or volume per mole, which is an intensive quantity. It's you know basically just the inverse of the density, which is also independent of the size of the system. And so the case of the free expansion is going to be different, right? Because instead of having a piston move up and down, either gradually or slowly, we are going to just have this ideal gas, which is going to stay, well, it actually doesn't matter if it's insulated from the environment or if it's in perfect thermal contact with the environment, as long as the environment has the same initial temperature, right? Because we're going to start with the gas confined up in the top by some barrier up there, and then we're just going to all of a sudden remove that barrier. And when we do, well, what's the gas going to do? Well, it's an ideal gas. It's just going, the gas molecules are just going to bounce around, and it's going to fill up the entire volume of the container now. And because it's expanding into a vacuum, it's not doing any work on anything, and there's not any work being done on it, because there's no piston for it to bounce off of or move. And this is where I need to mention a sort of subtle little thing that ideal gases expanding into other gases or just gases expanding into other gases they actually do do work uh, even though there's no piston but if they're expanding into a vacuum there's nothing for them to do work on right gases can do work on solids on liquids and on other gases but they can't do work on literally nothing <laughs> which is what a vacuum is and so there's no work because well there's nothing to do work on and there's no heat transfer because the temperature is just constant, right? And the density goes down. The, so the specific volume, the volume per mole or the volume per mass goes up. And as a result, the pressure is going to go down, but the temperature is the same, right? Because there's no process by which the gas molecules are going to gain or lose any energy. And so the temperature is constant. And so that looks an awful lot like the isothermal case, right? But in the isothermal case, we had some heat transfer, which was exactly equal to the work done by or on the gas. But in this case, we have the exact same end state. And because entropy is a state variable, because we have the same end state as the isothermal case, that also means we have the same entropy increase as the isothermal case. But in the isothermal case, we managed to get some work out of some heat. And so as a result, that entropy change is actually reversible. And it's reversible because you can always keep track of the change in entropy in terms of the second law. And the second law is an inequality, right? It says that entropy must increase by at least heat transfer divided by temperature, but it can increase by more. And in the free expansion of an ideal gas, there's no heat transfer, but entropy can go up, it just can't go down. And it goes up by the exact same amount that it goes up in the isothermal case, because the end state is exactly the same. And it involves a little bit of math, but we can calculate the entropy change for the isothermal expansion, because we can calculate the work and because we're saying that the temperature is constant, we're saying that there's no change in internal energy. So from the first law of thermodynamics, we can surmise that the heat transfer must be equal to the work. And because the temperature is constant, we can then divide that heat transfer by the temperature. And if we're saying that it's a reversible process with no spontaneous entropy increase, then we can say that the entropy increase in the gas is equal to the heat transfer in divided by the temperature and that energy doesn't go into changing the internal energy of the gas it goes into work but it does still change the entropy because the second because of well how the second law is formulated and that's reversible though because remember we're idealizing it as the isothermal gas being the exact same temperature as the surroundings so the entropy increase of the gas inside the cylinder is exactly equal to the entropy decrease of whatever is in the surrounding environment because that has to lose heat in order to transfer it into the gas. And so 
the net change in entropy is zero. But it's not zero for the free expansion, right? Because again, there's no heat transfer, but there's the same entropy increase, but without a corresponding entropy decrease anywhere else. And so the free expansion of an ideal gas is sort of a convenient way to understand spontaneous entropy increases that we can directly compare to reversible entropy increases. And it can also in turn be further compared to when you have entropy just being held constant, like in the adiabatic case. And I'm mentioning all of this because I'm behind on my much more complicated jet engine thermodynamics video, which was the original impetus for all of these thermodynamics videos, and I'll hopefully be releasing that soon, but it's going to be quite a bit longer than this one. And in that one, I'm going to be talking about shock waves, and shock waves are, well, they're, wa they're waves of pressure differential, and they inherently come with an entropy increase, uh, and it's an entropy increase that's predictable, because in general, predicting spontaneous entropy increases, it it can be done, like in the free expansion of an ideal gas, we can predict it exactly, but in general, predicting spontaneous entropy increases can be difficult. It is frequently doable, but sometimes it's not, and more often than not, we end up analyzing things for the ideal case with no entropy increase, and then we do experiments to conduct uh, analysis and compare the ideal to the non-ideal and find how much spontaneous entropy increase there is, but there's plenty of things where you can uh, if not calculate, at least tabulate from standardized experiments the spontaneous entropy increase, and that's going to turn out to be how shock waves work. And so I'll just leave you with this sort of compare and contrast here between the adiabatic, where there's no heat transfer, but there is work, so the change in internal energy is equal to the change in temperature, and there's no heat transfer, so there's no change in entropy, even though there's a change in temperature. Isothermal, where there's a change in the entropy of the working gas, but not a change in the global entropy between the outside system surrounding the cylinder and the gas inside the cylinder, because the entropy increase inside the cylinder is exactly balanced by the entropy decrease outside. And finally, free expansion of an ideal gas, where there's neither heat transfer nor work, but there is a spontaneous increase in the entropy. So please do let me know if you have any questions. I'll have the jet engine thermodynamics video up as soon as I can, and thanks for watching.